Father in heaven, that's our prayer this morning, that yes. you would fill Steve with your sweet Holy Spirit as he brings precious truths from your throne of grace. Touch his lips, touch his heart, and touch his mind as he breaks the bread of life to us. And may you get all the honor yes, and all Lord. the praise and all the glory that is due to your wonderful yes, name. Lord. It's in Jesus' holy and wonderful and loving name we pray. Amen. 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 Happy Sabbath, Little Creek. I know we can do a lot better than that, right? Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. God is good. Amen. He's good all the time. And it might uh, be a little dreary outside, it might be a little cool, and the weather has been kind of strange, but God is good. Where, we, where God is, we can be with him, and there's always sunshine, and there's always joy, and always hope when we have Christ with us. And we come to worship and praise his name on this, is Holy Sabbath day. So I think we should, let's just do this. It may not be customary, but God, I know, has blessed you richly. We're in 2016, a new year, praise the Lord. Let's just give God a hand clap of praise for what he's done, what he is doing, and what we know he will continue to do as we keep our hands in his hands. I do want to say it is a privilege, a blessing, and an honor to be with you once again. This is uh, my family and I's first uh, time to be able to be with you since the sanctuary is open, and I just want to say it, it's a blessing to be here the, the building is immaculate, it is welcoming and inviting, and I know a lot of hard work, prayer, uh, sacrifice, blood, sweat, tears, and, and giving have, has gone into this project over the years, and I just want to say let your light shine in this community, in Clayton, and uh, in the surrounding areas, and God will continue to richly bless you. I do know that for sure. It's just um, a privilege to be with you once again and I do want to acknowledge my wife Valencia and our and our daughters and as as Lee mentioned they are growing it's amazing how uh, when you feed kids and let them get some rest and <laughs> you know give them some water they tend to grow so it's amazing uh, <laughs> it's amazing I can remember um, wh whenever I see like a, a newborn baby or a family with you know the, the um, uh, car seat and the little carriers and the strollers. I'm like, man, I'm glad I'm past those days. <laughs> wow. But it's a blessing. So uh, I do thank Valencia and my daughter Essence, who is five, will be six next month, and Hannah, who's four and a half. Um, it's a pr privilege, and I thank God that they're, they're the reason why uh, I'm, I'm able to have hope despite all the uh, negativity in the world and the things that, going, that are going on. I can see their excitement about Jesus, and it just reminds me of the fact that Jesus wants us to be like little children, have that, that excitement and that humble faith uh, to trust him and believe in him in all things. So thank uh, Elder Dan and Elder Lee for the invite once again. I don't want to worry your patience very long. Let me see if I can find the clicker here, fellas. Let's see. Yes, I have it. Let me make sure it's on. It is on. Hopefully we're connected. Um, I'm not going to worry your patience too long, uh, but I do want us to turn back to the scripture that uh, Brother Lee read for us, and we will just quickly review that once again. We're reading in Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 4, and we're going to read through again verses 13 through 20, Acts chapter 4, verse 13 through 20. Let's see if it's showing up. Yep. If you haven't, say amen, or you can follow along on the screen. Verse 13, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled, and they realized that they had been with Jesus. Oh, by the way, amens and praise the Lord. If you hear something you agree with, I think it's a good thing. God, in, thank you, sister. God inhabits our praises, right? So he wants to know that we're listening and that we're engaged. And me personally, as a speaker, when I know you're out there listening and engaged, it helps me. It motivates me. So feel free to say amen if you hear something that you agree with. Verse 14, and seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, 
they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For indeed, that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. 17, but so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. And whose name were they speaking in? Jesus' name, yes. Verse 18, so they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God you judge, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Amen. Amen. Seen and heard. That's the title for the message this morning, the things which we have seen and heard. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, it is a blessing to be in the house of the Lord, in this house of prayer, with my brothers and sisters here at Little Creek Seventh-day Adventist Church. We thank you, Lord, for what you have done for us this week and allowing us to come together to worship corporately. We thank you for being a God who sits high and looks low, who loves us on an intimate basis. You said the very hairs on our head are numbered. So we thank you for being close to us, being Abba. We thank you for being our Father. We ask that your Holy Spirit be with us. We ask that all distractions be removed from this sanctuary so that we can hear from you. Lord, bless me, fill me with your spirit, give me a double portion of your spirit, so that the words that you gave to me can be delivered clearly to your people, so that we can all be edified and changed accordingly. Lord, help us, bless us, and keep us. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, let the church say, amen. 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 So, things that we have seen and heard. I read that text in Acts about Peter and John's confrontation with the Sadducees because it has some key points that go along with the topic that the Lord gave me this week to share with you. And that topic, that topic is witnessing. That topic is witnessing. And um, I know that sometimes when we hear that word or we think about witnessing, uh, we begin to get a little uneasy, a little uncomfortable Uh, We begin to wonder, uh, am I adequate enough? We become, uh, you know, we just, our countenance change sometimes. Not all of us, but a lot of us are not very comfortable with the idea of witnessing. And I hope today that as we go through the message, we will be able to examine some of the excuses, some of the hangups that we uh, encounter when it comes to preventing us from being witnesses for Christ in the manner that we should. So as we examine some of the excuses that we tend to make for not witnessing, we can face some of our fears and hopefully we'll have a clearer picture as to uh, how we can overcome those fears and and not to begin to always look at witnessing and sharing our faith uh, as something dreaded, something to be afraid of, uh, but maybe it can start to become a part of who we are a part of who we are as we have been called to be witnesses for Christ. Amen? And most importantly, we want to see what God has to say because we can get answers from his word. And we're going to look at the life of, uh, not the whole life, of um, the encounter that Moses had with God in chapter 3 and 4 in Exodus. And we're going to kind of see how God already addresses a lot of the hang-ups and the excuses that we come up with as we see this interaction between Jehovah and Moses, all right? So, and we know that it's not just an optional thing for us as believers. It's not an option or something, yeah, maybe I'll witness, maybe I won't, because God has called us to do that. And in Matthew 24, Jesus expressly said, Um, that this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all of the nations, and then what? The end shall come. So it's incumbent upon us. It's not uh, the angel's job. Now, the angels will help us, right? They'll give us the strength. They'll help us along our way. They'll protect us. 
But God has given the gospel commission to you and I, to believers in him. So, and, and Jesus, and when he says something, it's in red letters in your Bible, I believe. So when he says something that important, I think it's incumbent upon us to follow through with it. Spreading the gospel in the context of the three angels' messages is of paramount importance if we want Christ to return to this sin sick world any time soon. A lot of us feel like it's just the pastor's job. Like, hey, the pastor, it's his job, or the elders, they have the uh, spiritual acumen and they're supposed to do it, the deacons are supposed to do it. No, yes, they're supposed to do it, but each and every one of us, from the pulpit to the back row, we have a responsibility, an opportunity, a privilege to be able to share. So if you think it's somebody else's job, you're sadly mistaken and should reevaluate re those thoughts as soon as possible, like right now. All right? So I gave the passage in um, Acts chapter 4, and we're going to come back there. But before we come back there, we're going to deal, like I said, with the life and uh, interaction with God, that God had with Moses in uh, Exodus chapter 3 and 4. Um, some of those hang-ups and excuses that Moses gave is the same ones that we give. So we need to examine those and see what God has to say about it. And um, like I said before, God told us, even in, I mean, Jesus told us even in Mark 16, 15, to what? Go into the world and preach the good news to all creation. So we have a commission to do so. So let's take a look at it. I came up with the five excuses of Moses, and we're going to tackle each one, and, uh, and then we're going to bring this thing full circle before our time is up. We're going to tackle the whole excuses by looking at the call of the patriarch Moses. When God appeared to Moses in the burning bush, he called him to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. In response, Moses made up excuses, telling God why he was not the man for the job. So let's look at Moses' excuses and God's responses to them, because as God's people today, we, like Moses, have received from God a special calling. We are, <clears throat> we are called not to deliver people from physical bondage, per se, like Moses was out of, out of the Egyptian slavery captivity, but in a more in significant and important sense from spiritual bondage, to preach Christ's message of deliverance to a world in bondage to sin. Too often, however, we, have, we behave just like Moses, making excuses. So we're going to look at the five excuses that I, I, I want to share and then what God's uh, response is as we look at this encounter at the burning bush. So what's the first excuse? Moses said what? Who am I? Who am I? Number one. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children out, the children of Israel out of Egypt? Who am I? How many of us have ever wondered about our, uh, our adequacy or our capabilities, right? Or if we can do it. Who am I? I'm just Stephen McLeod. Grew up in Raleigh. I, you know, hey, who am I? But God addresses that. Remember that Moses was once a member of the ruling house of Egypt, but now he was a humble shepherd. It had been 40 years since he had been in Egypt. He was 80 years old, already past the average lifespan for his generation. For these reasons, Moses wondered whether he was the right man for the job. But God's response to Moses saying, who am I, it was quick, it was decisive, and that should have been really the end of the discussion. As he assured Moses that he said, I will certainly be with you. That's what he said in Exodus 3.12. I will certainly be with you. God, Elohim, Adonai, Yahweh, Jehovah, the great I am himself promised to be with Moses. And this alone should have been enough to end the discussion and the back and forth about his inadequacies and nervousness about leading his people. You see, some of us insist that we are insufficient for the task. And it's true that by ourselves we are insufficient, but God is the one who makes us sufficient. Amen? 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 
verses uh, 5 and 6. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. So in so many words, God is the one, if he says he's with us, we don't have to worry about our background, our skin color, our education level, right? Our inadequacies, right? He says he would be with him. And the same God who told Moses that is the same God who is promising us that today, right? As we are, are spiritual Israel, trying to lead others to a loving relationship with Christ. Through Jesus, God has provided us the same assurance he gave to Moses. Because in Matthew 28, 20, Jesus said, Lo, I am with you some of the time. No, always, always, exactly. And the word always, if you had to explain it, what, how would you define always if you were having to explain that to my, to my five-year-old? And she said, never not there. Excellent. He used a, a double negative. To talk about a positive. He's never not there, which means he's what? Always there. Somebody else? Always. How would you do? Forever. Yes. Forever. Yes. Anybody else? From now on. Yes. From now on. At all times, invariably, forever, perpetually, every time, on every occasion, without exception, continuously. I think we have the picture. What a mighty promise we have. Pre-incarnate Christ told Moses that he would certainly be with him. And this same Christ, uh, when he was here on earth, promised his apostles and disciples, and thus, by extension, you and I, that lo, he is always uh, with us forever, perpetually, every time, even to the end of the age. That's a promise you can take to the bank. So with his help, we can accomplish anything he wants us to do including sharing him with others. When it comes to witnessing, we can say, as Paul did in Philippians 4.13, so let's say it together, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Our excuses for not doing what the Lord has called us to do are lame and really indicate a lack of faith. Yet we come up with excuse after excuse. So we see that even after Moses said, who am I, in this first excuse, God refuted it. We see that he quickly and unfortunately came up with another excuse. Number two, what shall I say? What shall I say? So first, who am I? I'm a nobody. And then, okay, God, you're going to be with me, but what am I going to say? Okay, all right, we'll see. Exodus 3.13, then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? Moses knew that if he went to the children of Israel, they were bound to ask questions such as, Who is this God you sent us, sent, that you sent to us? Why are we to leave the country that has been our home for the past 400 years? See, they had been there so long in bondage and captivity, they had lost sight of Yahweh. They had lost sight of God. And it's an unfortunate thing. How many of us are in bondage and losing sight of God? But again, the Lord's response was quick and decisive. Exodus 3, 14 and 15. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me, I am has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. God told Moses what he should say in response to the Israelites' questions. And again, us today, bringing it down to a personal level, we use some of the same excuses. What shall I say? How can I share Christ? Uh, 
What if they ask me questions I can't answer? I'm not familiar and, and versed enough to explain the 2,300 days and the 70 weeks. We get so caught up in what we can't do, we forget what we can do through God who is by our side. Amen? We can't lose sight of the fact that we have to tell people the good news of Jesus Christ in a simplistic, real way. That's what God wants us to do. We may try to excuse ourselves by saying that our knowledge is inadequate, but God had to has told us what to say, and today it is really quite simple. It is the good news of Jesus Christ, his love for us, his death on the cross, his resurrection, his intercession as our high priest and mediator, and his soon imminent return. If we could just share that in simple ways to people, start with the love of Christ. So many people are hurting and despondent and looking for love in all the wrong places. Tell them that there is a Savior who loves them, loves them so much that he died for them, there's no greater love than that to the sacrifice to lay down a life for your friend. And that's what God did for us. So start with that, the love. Talk about that he died on the cross. There was a, a need for a sacrifice for our sins. And he did it, the one who knew no sin. And talk about how the grave, though, couldn't hold us. And he rose again. His resurrection gives us hope that we serve a risen Savior who's in the w world today. Amen. And talk about how he intercedes for us as our mediator. Someone who, who knows our inadequacies and knows our infirmities. Was tempted in all points as we are yet without sin. He's the one who intercedes on our behalf and pleads to the Father on our behalf. And hears our prayers. And talk about how the fact that he said he's coming again soon. He made that promise. And that this world in the state that it's in will not go on and on and on in the, way it, in, in the way it is now. Things may get worse, but that means that Jesus is that much closer to coming. Give people that nugget of hope that Jesus promised and he said he's coming soon. All of that is good news. And we're so hesitant for some reason to share good news, but so quick to share bad news. Isn't that an interesting phenomenon? Right? Good news, man, we're quick, shy, get timid, forget. But when it's bad news, oh, man, let's share that quick. Bad news travels fast. Good news, not so much. But we can reverse that trend, amen? So let's look at the next excuse because we know he wasn't done at just two. He went on to a third one in Exodus 4.1. Suppose they will not believe me. Who am I? What shall I say? God gives responses to both. Now he's saying, suppose they will not believe me. Exodus 4.1. Then Moses answered and said, but suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say the Lord has not appeared to you. Now that he had been given words to say, Moses suggested that the people not, might not listen to him. Had he already forgotten? That the Lord would be with him always, forever, perpetually, continually, without cease. But Jehovah in his patience and mercy responded by equipping him with several convincing proofs to demonstrate his power to the potential skeptics, Moses himself and the skeptics uh, that he would encounter. And so we know some of these, we don't have to go over them in detail, but we know that um, he took Moses' staff, turned it into a serpent, turned it back. He, uh, Moses put his hand in his cloak and he turned leprous, put it back, it came out fresh. You know, he did these things, the, the water which turned to blood when it fell on the ground in Exodus 4, 9, etc. He showed him. And, and it's amazing that some people have to have a sign, right? Have to have a sign. And Jesus dealt with that a lot because he did many great signs, but he was like, why, why do I have to do signs? Just believe me because I'm telling you I'm one with the Father. And he said, you know, an adulterous generation looks for a sign. But God went ahead and showed Moses that uh, he, he wouldn't have to worry and that they would believe because he did uh, these great things to show him his power. Some believers today are 
uh, hesitant in the call to witness for the same reason. The fear of failure keeps us from trying. The fear of failure keeps us from trying. But just as God gave Moses convincing evidence, so he has given us the evidence is necessary to convince the honest and sincere person. The word of God, especially its evidence concerning the resurrection of Christ and fulfilled prophecy, prophecy is able to produce faith. Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing by the word of God. For this reason, we cannot justify, um, you know, we can't just miss sharing the gospel with others because there, there's no really no excuse. One would think that by this point in the discussion with God, Moses would accept the call, but he quickly concocted yet a, another, a fourth excuse. Oh, man. So now he goes back to some of his own inadequacies. I'm slow of speech and slow of tongue. Exodus 4.10. Then Moses said to the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. So he then again turns the focus back on himself and what he couldn't do. He may have had a speech impediment, a stutter, or uh, you know, some, some hang up with his speech. And he, he leaned on that crutch. When God is the one who created his mouth and his tongue, right? And gave him the ability to talk. But yet he focused in on his inadequacies and what he couldn't do. You know, that little word, let me see if my um, laser pointer works. Where is it? I'm in the wrong. Let's see. Uh, yeah, there it is. There's the word. What's that word right there? Can see anybody see that? Let me put it in on this side too. Let's see where it go. What's that word right there? Yeah, it's a little three-letter word that we love to throw in there. God has told how great He is, how awesome He is, how wonderful He is, how mighty He is, how how powerful He is, and how He will be with Him always. And then he throws in a but. How many times do we do that? I love you, Lord, but. I trust you, Lord, but. You know, let's not let the little word but get in the way of us being, receiving a blessing and being a blessing to others. Moses claimed that he was not an eloquent speaker. However, God was not moved by this objection. Exodus 4 let me read 11 and 12. Exodus 4, 11 and 12. Good old Exodus. Shouldn't be hard to find. There it is. Exodus 4, 11 says, So the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth, and teach you what you shall say. Right? Right? He, he, God is, is wonderful. He's the creator. He's, he's the infinite one. He's not bound by the little hang-ups that we have because of uh, being degraded by sin, right? He's able to work through us, and he's telling them that. And then we know he goes on to explain later on in, in verses 4 through 16 that he had even arranged a mouthpiece for Moses, his brother Aaron, right? So God always has a way. If we're willing, God has a way. Amen? Some Christians try to use this excuse, I am slow of speech and tongue. They lament that they cannot speak well or are too timid to speak in public. Automatically, when people think about witnessing, they think, okay, well, that means I have to speak in public or be an evangelist. No, that doesn't always mean that. That's important and a critical piece to sharing the gospel. But that's not we don't need to let that be a hang-up that we can't uh, speak well or that we're um, not good public speakers. 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 4 says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. It's Paul speaking. For I determined not to know anything among you except what? Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling, and my spirit speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. So this is Paul saying, look, I had, I had a speech problem too, Moses. But I was able to let the Lord use me because he was willing. The same 
can be said for us. Don't worry about your inadequacies. Don't worry about your background, where you come from, how much money you have, who, what your daddy did or your mommy did, right? What your uncle did, right? Don't worry about any of that because God is able to use you if you're willing to be used. You see, fear did not stop the Apostle Paul, and it has not stopped others, and it will not stop us if we just try. And the personal witnessing that we must do is simple. It is reaching those in our sphere of influence. It doesn't necessarily mean getting up in front of crowds, but instead, one-on-one with those at our jobs, our family members, in our neighborhoods, etc. Those that we can reach. God, did you realize that God placed you right where you are for a reason? He did. It's for a reason. And you can reach people that I can't reach because I don't know the people you know. And you can't reach the people that I can reach because you don't work and, and, and go and, and live next to the people that I live next to. So God placed you right where you are for a reason, to be a, 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 an influence for the kingdom to those who are around you. Sister White, Ellen G. White. The SDA Bible Commentary, volume 6, page 1091, put it this way. A testimony from the heart coming from lips in which there is no guile, full of faith and humble trust, though given by a stammering tongue, by given by a stammering tongue is accounted for God as precious as gold. As precious as gold. That's what she says. And I believe it. We have considered four excuses that Moses gave, but as we can see, they were not really valid. However, in Exodus 4, 13, we learn the true reason that Moses kept making excuses. We learn really what was at the crux of everything he was telling God and coming up with excuse-wise. Please send someone else. That was it. That was the bottom line. Exodus 4.13, but he, Moses, said, oh, my Lord, please send by the hand of whomever else you may send. Whoever else. Eugene Peterson, the message paraphrase version, Exodus 4.13, puts it this way. He, Moses, said, oh, master, please send somebody else. That was the bottom line. Moses simply didn't want to go. His previous excuses were simply attempts to hide the fact that he did not want to accept God's challenge. Now that the facade is removed, God's impatience with Moses becomes evident. His wrath is a little bit kindled against Moses because in verse 15 and 16 of Exodus 4, we see that God was through playing around with Moses. Listen to how he responds. Listen, verse 15, chapter 4, Exodus. Now you shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth. And I will be your mouth and with his mouth, and I will teach you that you shall do. So he shall be your spokes, spokesman to the people, and he himself shall be as a mouth for you, and you shall be to him as God. And you shall take this rod in your hand with which you shall do the signs. What word keeps coming up? Shall. Seven times in three verses. The God, God says, Shall. He means business. He's saying, look, you got to do this. You will. You shall. You must. You will. He means business because he knew the potential that was in Moses, despite Moses not knowing the potential he had in God. Right? It's amazing. We find similar parallels in our own lives as to what Moses went through. Usually the excuses we dream up are just that. They're excuses, not valid reasons. We would rather God send someone else. We really don't want to do what God has called us to do. We really don't. But folks, it is time for us to step out on faith and finish the work laid before us. Satan knows he has but a short time, and he's feverishly doing everything he can to bring as many of us as possible to be destroyed with him. And sadly, I dare say shamefully, We have put our zeal for witnessing on cruise control. Come on, saints. It's time to wake up, pray for personal revival, corporate revival, and a return to the first love that made us excited about sharing our faith and being in this remnant movement in the first place. Amen?
We are in spiritual warfare, and none of us can sit on the sidelines and pretend to be spectators. We have to be actively engaged in witnessing. If God didn't accept Moses' excuses, he certainly won't accept mine or yours. Right? Jesus detests fence riders and lukewarmness. Right? He wants us to be the hotter cold for him. He, he can deal with you if he knows you're cold and, and just, you know, going in straight. Or if you're hot on fire, he's happy and excited and he's blessed to see you that. But when you're in this, this, this mix of, well, you know, I don't know, I should, maybe I shouldn't, maybe they may say this, maybe. God doesn't want that. He's not going to accept that. He's displeased, in fact, with that. And, and church, think about it. Obviously, everybody sees the news and knows what's going on in our political climate and those who are running for, for office for the presidency, right? The Seventh-day Adventists are in the news. So, it, it, you know, we're a little flock that's becoming more known and known. So the opportunity to share faith, to get the true message out about what we believe versus what the media is taking bits and, bits and pieces and putting them together and trying to, to, to say that we're, you know, a cult or outcast or, or have some weird doctrines, right? We have an opportunity, a responsibility, right? This is, uh, you talk about entering wedges, right? The health message, yeah, that's good, but look, you can just come straight out with it. Our name is already in the news. Talk about what we believe from the word of God to counteract what? The counterfeit and the misinformation that's being put out there, right? And we have to pray for for, for, for all those who are obviously in political office and running for office, and God knows what's going to happen. I'm not, you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen with all of that. And, and, and Brother Carson, you know, God bless his heart, whatever the Lord has laid on him. But the bottom line is it's an opportunity for us all as, as believers, as Bible Christians, as Seventh-day Adventists, to tell our friends and neighbors, yeah, that brother, yeah, he, he's aligned with our church, but here's, Here's what our church believes from the Bible, despite some of the things that may, he may have said that are a little um, questionable or maybe taken out of context. Here's what the Jesus I serve teaches me, and this is why I follow Christ, and this is why I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. Amen? Slide 16. Next slide. Yes. Patriarchs and Prophets, 255. Ellen White says, the divine command given in Moses found him found him self-distrustful, slow of speech, and timid. He was overwhelmed with the sense of his incapacity to be a mouthpiece for God to Israel. But having once accepted the work, he entered upon it with his whole heart, putting all his trust in the Lord. Let me read that again. But having once accepted the work, he entered upon it with his whole heart, putting all his what? Trust in the Lord. The greatness of his mission called into exercise the best powers of his mind. God blessed his ready obedience and he became eloquent, hopeful, self-possessed, and well-fitted for the greatest work ever given to man. This is an example of what God does to strengthen the character of those who trust him fully and give themselves unreservedly to his command. If that's not an amen, I don't know what is, right? Oh, when we are willing to be willing, God will use us. When we step out on faith and say, Lord, yes, I am inadequate. I'm nervous. I'm scared. I'm not sure. But I know in you I can be confident. I know what your word says, right? And we're going to bring it full circle back to Acts 4. I'm getting there. I'm about to land this plane, as they say, right? What an opportunity. I began with Acts 4, 13 through 20, dealing with Peter and John's reply to the Sadducees' threats. Let's go back there and look at verse 13. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. And they, meaning the Sadducees, realized that they, meaning Peter and John, had been with Jesus. So it's clear, clear as day, that you don't have to be the most learned or scholarly person to be a witness for Christ. Andrews Seminary, Southern Southern University, Oakwood University, Loma Linda, not required. Great if you have those credentials and you went there and you 
studied theology, etc., but not necessarily. Not necessary, excuse me. For they were uneducated. Peter and John were uneducated and untrained. Jesus, they said, can anything good come from, from, from Nazareth? What? Can anything good come from Clayton, from Raleigh, from Garner? Huh? But they spoke with boldness and conviction because they had been with Jesus. And they could not but speak. They could not but speak the things which they had seen and heard, meaning that's, that's all they could say. They, that, they were just so enthused about talking about what they had seen Jesus do and what they had seen Jesus do through them. So the question, the question is this, what have you seen and heard? Has the Lord done anything for you that you can share with somebody? It is evident and clear that there are no valid excuses. We just went through five of them and how God refuted each one of them. There's no excuses for not sharing your faith. But in order to witness about Jesus, you must have actually had an experience with him. Had an experience. What have you seen and heard? Webster defines a witness as one who has personal knowledge of something. So you must have actually had an experience with the Savior to share him. And that means having a daily close walk with him and being led by the Holy Spirit. A witness in a courtroom can only tell about what he or she has seen, heard, or experienced. And the same goes for us today as members of the Advent movement. Are we walking close to Christ? Are we seeking him? Are we, are we searching for him? Remember the lost coin, the lost sheep. All those are, 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 are parables about people who are truly seeking after God. The lost son, prodigal son, right? It's God, God is longing for us to turn to him so we can experience him. And then through that experience, we're able to share something with somebody who's hurting somebody who is in need, somebody who is lost, somebody who's living a reckless, sinful life. God is waiting on you, waiting on me. The Upward Look, 247. Sister White beautifully and directly addresses this by saying, there's a world to be saved. What are you doing to cooperate with Christ? What are you doing to represent his humility of spirit? Are you seeking to become acquainted with those who are afflicted and suffering and who need your help? Are you using your opportunities and advantages and means in winning souls to Christ? You may say, I'm not a minister and therefore cannot preach the truth. Continuing the quote, she says, you may not be a minister in the generally accepted sense of the word. You may never be called to stand in the desk. Nevertheless, you can be a minister for Christ. If you will have your eyes open to see the opportunities that present themselves for speaking a word to this soul or to that. God will speak through you to lead them to Christ. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I was reading a book a few years back by this Adventist pastor and author Brian Jones and he, he has dealt with the same issue. In that book, Messengers on Golden Wings, he said, what the church needs, what Adventists need, is the fuel, full excuse me, imbuing of our hearts with the Holy Spirit, who would direct us into the patient yet eager waiting for our Lord from heaven. And look, he says, the waiting is not, pass, is not the passive detachment of onlookers. We're so, we're so easy to sit back and say, well, like I said, Pastors got it. Elders got it. I, I don't really have a role. I'm just coming and receiving and going and 
floating in the wind, right? No. The waiting is not the passive detachment of onlookers, but an active participatory expectation that encourages er people everywhere to prepare to meet the God of judgment and salvation. But for us to succeed in this work, we need the Holy Spirit as our guide, teacher, and equipper so that we can effectively represent God as his witnesses. Simple. We make it complicated. We come up with excuses. God has a, 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 a rebuttal to every one of our excuses. And he's equipping. It's, it's almost unfair. He's telling us to go and do this, and we worry about what we can't do, and he said, I'm going to help you through it. I mean, it's like taking a test, and you have the answers right next to it. It's almost unfair. God, he loves us. He died for us. He's equipping us. He sends the Holy Spirit. He says, I'm not going to leave you uh, comfortless. I'm going to send the comfort. I'm going to send the helper, the spirit of truth. He will teach you and guide you all things and lead you into all truth. And he's saying, go, be my witnesses. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, Lord, I'm with you always, perpetually, in perpetuity, forever, even unto the end of the age. With Moses, we know the rest of the story. Praise God, he answered the call and went to Egypt. He led the children of Israel as God delivered them out of Egyptian bondage. In humility, he finally trusted God and accepted the enormous challenge that he had been given by God, that had been given to him. But what about us? But what about us? What will be the rest of your story? What will be the rest of my story? Will we listen to the call to share the gospel with the lost? We all know a neighbor, a friend, a co-worker, a, a relative, a classmate, somebody who needs to hear these words and these wonderful truths which we have come to know. Will we listen to the call to obey and share the gospel of Christ or will we make excuses and one day suffer the wrath of God alongside those we never took the opportunity to witness to? Or even more tragically, because they may have not have known as much as we knew, but yet they had a simple faith, they'll be in the kingdom and you'll be lost. I'll be lost if we don't take the time to share the gospel. Because God knows the heart. He knows where people are at in their walk. But wouldn't it be a shame for us to be lost because we kept making excuses to whom much is given, what? Much is required. So being a seven-day Adventist is not a spectator sport. Being a Christian, being called of God is not a spectator sport. We have to actively be engaged. Only time will tell. But if you know what you should do, follow the example of Isaiah and respond to God's loving call and say, Lord, here am I, Lord, send me. Here am I, Lord, send me. Brother Dan, if you can play a soft hymn for us, I'm about ready to close. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Lee mentioned it. And um, most of you, some of you know, because we're friends, been friends for a long time. Maybe you saw on Facebook. Yeah, we've been going through a lot. The McClouds and Parkers, my wife's family. We've been going through a lot. Things that I didn't share, couldn't share, because I don't want to focus in on all this bad. But I want to say that it's taught us a lot. It's taught us that we have to put our hands in God's hands. Whether it's traveling down to Baton Rouge for Thanksgiving and the day we get there, Valencia's uh, step uh, half-brother, his mother passed away unexpectedly. While he was there, he tried to revive her. She wouldn't come back. He lost his mother right around Thanksgiving. And at the same time, his wife filed for divorce the day after the funeral. Things happen, and we wonder why it causes us 
to cry out. It causes us to question and to be upset. But we have to trust God. My grandfather has been in and out of the hospital. But God is still good. Life has challenges. My niece, as you guys know, was gone. But she's still alive. So we praise God despite what she went through. God is still good and he's teaching us along the way. He may not come when we want him, but he's always right on time. Their challenges and their situations. I was going to have to figure out how to explain to my daughters that their little doggy had died. But God brought him through. He's still with us and he's doing better. There's so many different things. But as I mentioned to Lee, don't focus in on, on all your issues. Focus in on the one who solves those problems. And brings us through. Because know that somebody somewhere is dealing with ten times what you're dealing with. And they're going through and they have a, a, a whole heap of problems that you would be thankful to have the problems you do have if you knew what they were going through. So just understand that as we sit in these pews, sit in these seats, that we're all going through something. But God is telling us, look, I'm with you always. And what I want you to do is not focus in on your issues, but focus in on me the Savior. Focus in on the problem solver. Be willing to be willing to be my mouthpiece, to be my witness, to tell others about my grace and love. Don't complicate it. <clears throat> Don't worry about what you can't do. Know that with God you can do all things. He's never failed. He's never failed. He's leading us every step of the way. We face challenges and disappointments and trials. <laughs> it's amazing. Pray for my wife's mom. She's got to have surgery. She's dealing with a, a gastrointestinal thing that the doctors cannot figure out what, keep call, what keeps causing her issues. But I know that God will see her through. He's an on-time God. He's amazing. He's a healer. He's a deliverer. And he's good to us. He's good to us. The words of this song, I'm going to just read these words because it's amazing. The name of the song is, is, is so send I you. It's in our hymnal 578. We're not going to sing. I'm going to just read the words. Just listen. It says, so sent I you, by grace made strong to triumph, or hosts of hell, or darkness, death, and sin, may name to bear, my, may name to bear, and that, in that name to conquer, so send I you, my victory to win. This is, this is a word, it's talking about the Lord sending us out into the highways and byways in our neighborhoods and on our jobs. So send I you to take to souls in bondage the word of truth that sets the captive free. To break the bonds of sin, to loose death's fetters. So send I you to bring the lost to me. Verse 3 says, so send I you my strength to know in weakness, my joy in grief, my perfect peace in pain. To prove my power, my grace, my promised presence. So send I you eternal fruit to gain. So send I you to bear my cross with patience. And then one day with joy to lay down. To hear my voice, well done my faithful servant. Come share my throne, my kingdom, and my crown. As the Father has sent me, so send. I you. Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed. Father, here we are. As broken, as bruised, as battered as we are. As inadequate we may feel. Here we are. We're standing in the need of prayer. 
As the old song said, not our mother, not our father, not our sister, not our brother. It's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. We need you right now. We've come to this place maybe not expecting to hear a word from you today, but we are glad we gathered to hear from you. And it's my prayer that each of us have been stirred in our souls just a little bit to realize that there are souls who are, 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 are lost, who are seeking, who don't know you. And you've placed us right where we are to be the conduit of your grace. But Lord, before we can do that, we have to be able to have experienced you, have seen you, have heard from you, so that we can tell them our story, so that we can tell them of your wonderful love of your mercy and your grace. Help us to not be sideline spectators, Lord, but help us to actively engage. From the oldest to the youngest, Lord, there's an opportunity for each of us to share something about your love. Help us to tell the story of Jesus and his love. We thank you, Lord. We praise you. We don't come for form or fashion, Father, on this your holy day. We come because we need you. We come because we've sinned and we've broken your heart. We've fallen short of your glory. But we confess, Lord, right now, each of us, our sins, our shortcomings, things that we've said, thought, or done that are displeasing in your sight, and we ask for forgiveness. And we ask for the power from on high to continue on in this Christian race. Help us, Lord, to overcome those sins that easily beset us, those temptations that come before us. Help us to rebuke each one with a thus saith the Lord, just as Jesus did in the wilderness when he was tempted of Satan. It is written, it is written, it is written. Help us, Lord, to be who you would have us to be. Help us, Father. We know that your character has been called into question before the entire universe by the adversary, and that soon and very soon you will be vindicated. You said in Isaiah 43.10 that we are your witnesses. Help us by the power of your spirit to step out with holy boldness to fulfill the commission you have given us so that Jesus can return. Father, you sent him to die for our sins on that old rugged cross, and we can never repay what Christ did for us. But give us the strength to share him and his love everywhere we go. There may be one under the sound of my voice who realizes their need for Jesus. They realize their need to experience him so that they can be who you would have them to be. If there's one who just wants to stand, Every head is bowed, every eye is closed, so don't worry about who's around you or what your neighbor's doing. If you feel that you want to publicly just, in, before God, just say, God, here I am, send me. Just stand to your feet. Lord, here I am, I want to do more for your kingdom. I may be inadequate, but I know you can do it through me, Lord whether it's children's ministries or whether it's outreach ministries or feeding the homeless or sharing a Bible study with my neighbor or my co-worker. Lord, I want to do more for you and I'm willing to be willing. If that's you, just stand where you are. The Lord sees you. He hears you. He knows your heart. Yes, Lord, move. Touch the hearts and minds of your people, Father. I raise my hand asking for a closer walk with you, asking that you use me in a better fashion. Help me to be willing to be willing, despite the setbacks, help me to realize they're just a setup for a comeback. These are your people, Lord. We are here. We are tired of playing games. We want to see you coming in the clouds of glory. We want to be in the first resurrection or be here on earth when you, are, when you burst forth at the trumpet call. Help us, Lord. When the dead in Christ rise, help us to be caught up in the air with them and so we can ever be with you. 
And if there's anything in our lives that's preventing our relationship with you from growing stronger, please help us, Heavenly Father. Please help us in the name of Jesus. You see your people standing, and we thank you. Father, these are your people. We're confessing to you that we need your strength. Bless each and every one who stood, and even those who did not stand today. May we be the lights in this dark world that you've called us to be and equipped us to be. We thank you that you don't call the equipped, but you equip the call. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your grace and mercy. Bless each and every one. Whatever their needs are, whatever the reason they stood, whether it's rededication or whether they realize they need to be closer to you and they have an opportunity to share you, bless them and they're going out and they're coming in. Bless them, Lord, from the crown of their head to the sole of their feet to help them to be the witnesses for Christ you've called us to be so that we can share the things that we have seen and heard. We pray this prayer humbly in the precious name of Jesus. Let the church say, Amen.